Right, so welcome to Batches of Equity Matters, the fiercely passionate podcast that champions diversity, equity, and inclusion, and today belonging through the power of human stories. Praise yourself for inspiring tales of our fearless DIB advocates who dare to challenge the status quo, pushing boundaries and sparking change in every corner of our world. Today, I have the honor of hosting an exceptional guest, Dr. Terry Lemon Streho, known as monumental figure in the realm of education and psychology. Dr. Strayhorn has dedicated his life to deepening our understanding of diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, or as we know it, DEIB. His insights have earned him a spot among the country's top diversity scholars by diversity issues in higher education, and he's widely recognized as a bridge builder between academic and student affairs. Dr. Strayhorn's contributions to the field are both extensive and profound. He has authored 12 books, including the award-winning College Students' Sense of Belonging and over 200 peer-reviewed journal articles and academic publications. Wow. His groundbreaking research has not only garnered over $10 million in support from premier agencies like the Lumina Foundation and National Science Foundation, but has also found its way into numerous respected publications, such as the Washington Post and the Chronicle of Higher Education. In addition to his scholarly work, Dr. Strayhorn wears multiple hats. He's a president and chief exec officer of Do Good Work Consulting Group, where he partners with multitude of institutions to foster their culture and inclusivity. He's also a professor of education and psychology and the director of Center for the Study of HBCUs at Virginia Union University, leading their belonging lab. His influence extends to being a diversity scholar in residence at Harrisburg Area Community College, a fellow of AGB's Institute of Leadership and Governance, and an active member of several nonprofit boards. Notably, he's a proud member of Alpha Pay, Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Dr. Strayhorn, we are truly excited to have you with us today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Baskar. Baz, glad to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. And thank you for that review of my bio. I totally approve that message um, and look forward to how we will talk through um, some of the research and experiences of my career. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, with your permission, I will kindly call you Terrell. And uh, thank you. Thank you. So, Terrell, can you share a little bit more about your early life and your career very early on? Sure. Um, So I was born and raised in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Uh, So I count Virginia Beach 757, shout out to the 757, as home, uh, born to two lovely parents who are still living. My mom, Linda, who's a public health nurse. And my father, uh, Pete, who is a retired salesman, used to sell furniture and then started selling cars and sold cars for a long, long time until retirement. Um, I have sisters and brothers. My brother, Will, is a award-winning, very highly regarded uh, hairstylist in the 757 uh, and uh, makeup artist. I mean, he's in all things beauty. And he also uh, hosts a radio show. And so he's quite a figure. Um, and then my sister, who lives in Columbus, Ohio, is uh, works for Amazon. But she also has her own company that now, uh, Creations by Kimmy, um, that apart from all of the things that she does for her clients, she has her brother, Terrell, as one of her clients. And she makes these wonderful hoodies. Um, This is the belonging hoodie that has the definition of belonging from my book, but there are several others that she does for for my work and my company. Um, And then I have a brother who is married in that area, another brother. um, And then probably most importantly for me, I have two kids, wonderful kids, um, Aaliyah and Tion. And they, Tion lives in Virginia Beach, Aaliyah just up the road in Richmond, Virginia. So Virginia has a you know, sort of special place in my heart always, because when I think of home, Virginia is one of them, and Virginia Beach, uh, particularly where my parents live. Wow, Bob, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing, Trail. 
When you look back into your early life and upbringing in Virginia, what comes up in your mind? What are some of the pleasant memories of growing up in the area? Um, you know, for the sake of the conversation, I might give you two. Um, <laughs> One that is probably going to resonate with most people in your listening audience as generally positive, and then one that I think gets to the heart of who I am and why I do the work that I do. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, growing up in Virginia Beach, Virginia, um, two, two wonderful, hardworking, dedicated parents, mm -hmm. um, but let's pull back the layers a bit, right? So I'm an African-American male. Those who listen to the audio, I don't know if you can tell that. Those who watch the video, you'll be able to see, yes, I'm, uh, I'm, I identify as Black and or African-American. Um, and I've been that way my whole life. My mom and dad both were African-American. And so we grew up, they settled down, bought a home in a predominantly white neighborhood. I went to predominantly white schools all of my life, elementary, middle school, high school, and the like. Um, so though Though we were in the neighborhood with people who were affluent, lots of my friends growing up, I remember them telling me their moms and dads were doctors and lawyers and judges. Um, and so I remember being able to go to beautiful parks after school and hang out. Um, our YMCA was well, um, you know, very clean, well stocked you know, cutting edge equipment. Just, I remember growing up, I didn't have the words for it when I was younger, but I grew up around affluence, around resources. I generally felt safe in my neighborhood. I felt like if something popped off and went wrong, I could call the police and they would be there. Um, that's my experience growing up, right? And, um, you know, I grew up not that far from the beach. And so when my friends, when I got old enough, maybe high school, and my friends wanted to hang out, I remember going to the beach. In fact, um, I started dating a woman at the time who was Indian. I won't say her name to protect the innocent. Um, but, you know, uh, she was um, an Indian woman. And at the time, her parents were not, they did not approve of her dating me. Um, because not so much because I was black, although that's true, but also because I'm not Indian and she's Hindi. So I also was not Hindi. And, um, so you put those two together and just made me like not the appropriate choice for her. She was also very, very, um, religious in a sense, her family was. And so, I mean, her marriage and future had already been figured out for her. Um, again, that's not my cultural experience. It's not my religious lens. So I didn't know anything about it. We were in high school. Um, but there was a time where hopefully she won't be listening in your audience because <laughs> I'm about to reveal a secret. So I remember being in high school, we were dating, her parents were not approving, my parents did approve, and we went to the beach. And I remember laying out on the beach on a towel, we were just talking under the stars um, as we watched the water from the ocean and we could listen to it. It was beautiful, Baz. And I, I ended up, I'm a musician, so I ended up writing a song for her about it. Um, so when I think about Virginia Beach growing up, I think about the beauty of the water, the sun, the peace of the sound of the ocean, friendships, family, school. You know, there's, Virginia has a hashtag or a tagline that says Virginia is for lovers. It's on our license plate. It's on everything. And when I think about Virginia, I do think about love. I think about like, you know, childhood love and relationships. I think about love with my family. I think about um, my, I'm a, I identify as a Christian and a lot of my spiritual upbringing happened in Virginia at my home church. And so those are very positive images and memories associated with growing up in Virginia. Let's flip for a moment. When I was in high school, growing up, dating an Indian woman, a girl, but woman, um, and in a school where there were not many African-Americans and certainly not many high-performing African-Americans. So as an African-American male who was consistently on the honor roll or got straight A's, I stood out as an exception mm -hmm. to that. And for that reason, most of my cohorts, my social network, my friendship groups, the people who took courses with me were white and non-black. And so um, 
you know, thinking about who my best friend in high school's name was Jason. There's just a lot of those kind of memories, right? So I was active. I was generally popular and beloved by my friends. At least I thought I was. Um, and so by the time I get to 12th grade, I, um, by the time I got to 12th grade, I ran for student government Ooh. president. And remember, I've had generally positive experiences, generally positive memories, right? I'm in 12th, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in high school, definitely. I think I'm in 10th grade, but, um, and I'm running for SGA president. And I ran on the platform of um, Kermit the Frog. And my metaphor was, it's not easy being green. And I used that to sort of um, communicate what it's like being the other in our high school. I had friends, but I knew I was different. Um, you know, I was in the honors courses and in the honor society, but I still knew I was different. I remember I was a photographer for the yearbook club, and but I still knew that my experience were different from some, and I knew that there were other people in the school, not all African American, but people of color, low income, LGBTQIA+. There were other students in the school who were also feeling the sense of otherness. So I thought I could, um, you know, communicate with them and earn their vote um, by using Kermit the Frog as a metaphor, not talking explicitly about race and identity, but using it and saying, it's not easy being green, but I think, you know, if you elect me as your president and we work together, we can make it better for everyone. All right. So I put all these signs up across the school as my picture on green paper and all this stuff. One day, my mom and dad got a phone call saying we had to come out to the school. We went out to the school and the principal shared with us that all of my flyers had been defaced by someone with the N word on it. And I remember that moment, this is many, many years ago. I think it's important because it was the first time that I remember thinking, wow, race matters. Mm. Who I am matters. Like I enjoy generally positive friendships with my friends, but I have no idea what they think about me and my race because we don't spend time talking about race and racism in our when we're hanging out and studying for calculus. Um, so as although the weight of my memories are generally positive. I would say that um, moments like that were instrumental mm. in sensitizing me to the realities of race and racism and other social injustices that likely drives me in my work towards social justice and diversity and equity today. Wow, thank you, Mike. That's very profound, Cheryl. Thank you for sharing. And uh, I, I was planning to ask you what inspired you to choose your field of study in education and psychology. You already kind of answered it, but let's just ask, let me ask that question anyway. You finished your 10th grade, 12th grade, and the choice of your education, especially, and then going all the way to PhD. Talk us through why this topic, why this subject? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great follow up to the anecdote that I just shared. I mean, I left high school again. I'm not I wasn't bitter. I remember, um, you know, my mom and dad and my grandmother when she was alive were um, very um, direct and sometimes maybe not so direct, but they were, I would say, relatively transparent and honest with with us about the kind of world that we would um, move into. So I remember growing up, my parents saying things like, especially my mom, who no doubt will listen to this when you release it. Um, she and my dad, they, they are um, amazing people and they support all of their kids in our endeavors. But my mom would tell me growing up, you know, you're going to have to work twice as hard mm -hmm. to get half as much. And I was always good at math and I liked math. So that equation, that formula never made sense to me. Like, why should I have to work twice as hard and only get half? And she would tell me like, because you're black and you're living in America where race will matter and the good news. So some people would say that can be um, defeatist, that can throw water on the motivations of young people. And I'm not trying to um, deny that possibility. But the way that my mom, my dad, my grandmother, and my family um, balanced it out is they helped us realize. So if 
you had to work twice as hard to get half as much. Um, just imagine how much you can get if you are willing to stay focused, you know, ask for help, um, work hard, um, you know, believe in yourself, all the things that we know that matter. And so I left high school with this awareness about the world. Um, and quite honestly, an awareness about myself that some people take longer to develop. So when I went to college, um, you know, we didn't call it this at the time, but I went to college woke, socially conscious. I knew that race mattered. I knew that I got to the University of Virginia, which is, you know, one of the country's number one public universities. That's just not me saying that. That's U.S. News and World Report. No one listens to U.S. News and World Report anymore. But um, I got to UVA partly because I worked hard. I studied hard. I got good grades. I um studied when other people were playing. Those kind of things are undeniably true. But it's also true that I got to UVA because my parents, my grandmother invested in me, supported me. I got to UVA because of Miss Cannon, my sixth grade teacher, who, I mean, I remember growing up, I, um, you know, never really, I don't, I didn't have many teachers of color. And so I remember um, vividly, I, I had one male teacher in fourth grade, Mr. McCarthy, and I had one black teacher in sixth grade, Miss Cannon. Um, I would tell people I got to UVA because of Miss Cannon, who, you know, could have sent me to the principal's office. Look, Baz, I was probably this size. I was a spun size dude um, dealing with, we didn't call it this, people would call it teasing, but it was bullying. People would bully me because of my size. They would bully me because I didn't want to goof off. I didn't want to be a prankster. I wanted to study. I wanted to spell the word correctly. I wanted to ace the math exam. And to be a fun-sized Black guy in a public school at that time who's focused on academics, not sports, focused on school, not um, you know misbehaving, made me popular among teachers, but the direct target of the joke for my friends. And so I think that's important because um, what I realized is um, in sixth grade, I was really fortunate to have Miss Cannon, a Black teacher who saw me and rather than send me to the principal's office, she pulled me closer to her. Rather than refer me to detention, she called my mother and she told me, young man, I see something in you that you don't see in yourself. Stop goofing off. Stay focused. Um, if you stay focused and work hard, you there's no limit to where you will go. So rather than um, kick me out of the class, she actually um, helped me find my place in the classroom. And... I know that it's that kind of ethic of love and care and support and community that so many students need, not just Black students, but so many students in schools, and they just don't get it because teachers are, you know, forced to teach to the test. They're rushing to deal with a lot of different priorities, but that is what motivated my work on belonging is understanding relationships mm -hmm. make a difference when it comes to student support. So um, real quick. I went to college. I was a music major um, and a religious studies major, which simply meant I had to go to grad school <laughs> because I didn't know what I was going to do with those majors. Um, other than the fact that I do play the piano and I usually play for churches and I am now an ordained elder in my faith tradition. So, um, you know, they're, they're related, but they were not where I wanted to spend <clears throat> the bulk of my time. So I went to graduate school. When I thought about grad school, I decided to go to education. I think in part because my grandmother, my maternal grandmother who helped raise me was a teacher. And I love teaching, but I found my um, greatest passion and interest in post-secondary higher education, not K-12 education. And so um, as it were, I would declare a master's in education policy. And then I worked for the Council of Graduate Schools in Washington, DC, taught in a public school in Prince George's County, Maryland and then realized the need for additional training and upskilling. So I went back to get my doctorate. And after completing my doctorate, I started my faculty career at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And the rest has been a real uh, journey. I, I remember, and I I'll close on this, um, when I was in my doctoral program, um, I did not know what a professor did. I didn't know, I mean, I had spent 
all of these years with professors, but had no idea what their work was. And one day my doctoral advisor, Don Kramer said to me, you know, Terrell, I think you ought to be a professor. And I said, professor, okay, cool. He's like, yep, I think you make a great professor. And I said, so what in the world do you do as a professor? And about 18 years ago, I would not have known what this was, but he pulled out his cell phone, went through his calendar and he talked to me about what he did, about grading papers, about working on publications, about going to conferences and giving keynotes. Listen, Baz, 18 years ago, I didn't really know what a keynote was. And it was my doctoral advisor who introduced me to the importance of sharing your work, your scholarship with broader public audiences. And I thought that was so exciting. And as a result, he introduced me to my vocation. He actually introduced me to my calling. I like to say he introduced me to a world I knew nothing about. And it was absolutely the world for me. That is the power of mentoring in my mind is that um, you have these matches across people and the protege trusts the mentor and the mentor invests in the protege and together they make sense. Um, and as a result, I mean, I've been at this now, I have no intentions of stopping and I've been able to work with a lot of wonderful students and do um, engage them in my work the same way my advisor engaged me. Wow, wow. I think uh, you're kind of condensed uh, most of your uh, journey in, in like few minutes here. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you for joining. And uh, I think now you are uh, part of the academia. And as, as you rightly said, you have been mentored and, um, and uh, your life kind of, uh, kind of, you know, nurtured you towards where you are today. But can you share an unexpected finding from your research? that actually changed the way that you view the education? Yes. Um, I'll say it this way. Mm. I am comfortable identifying today as a belonging scholar. Mm. Um, it's not the, the only focus of my research and scholarship, but it is a primary thrust of it. Before I adopted that identity, I called myself a student success scholar mm -hmm. because primarily I saw my science about trying to understand factors and conditions that enable the success of students at the K-12 and higher and post-secondary tertiary level. All right. What I learned is this. If you take 100 students who are successful in school or in college. Or you could flip it and take 100 students who are not successful mm -hmm. in school or in college. Mm -hmm. And if you start looking at certain explanatory variables, factors, right? So you got 100 students who dropped out of college and you ask them which of the following reasons were your primary reason for dropping out of college. Financial, okay, some of them will raise their hand. They, they dropped out because they couldn't afford it. They dropped out because they couldn't pay their tuition. They dropped out because they need to go work instead of go to school, right? A hundred, but that only explains about 30 of them. Mm. Still got 70 people who dropped out of college who had the money to be there, but they still dropped out. So then you ask yourself, okay, so how many of you dropped out for academic reasons? Because your grades weren't good enough, because the rigor of the curriculum was too strong or too uh, much. Um, you didn't feel prepared for the challenges you were facing. How many of you, of the 70 who remain, how many of you left for academic reasons? Hands would go up. Mm. But interestingly, you would still have somewhere between 30 and 40 people standing, meaning it only explains another 30 or 40 percent. All right. So of the remaining 30 or 40 who are there and you ask them, how many of you left for, you know, fill in the blank reasons? Let's say we stop giving it to them. We ask them, why did you leave? Mm -hmm. And they start sharing their words. You would hear things like, uh, it, it just didn't make sense for me. It just didn't feel right to me that I didn't feel like I, um, I didn't know anyone. I was lonely. Um, I missed home. Um, you know, I felt like I couldn't be myself. I felt judged. I felt surveilled, monitored. Okay, so all these things, right? Put them together. 
these social factors have a lot to do with things like relationship, community, feeling seen, cared about, included, um, safe. And so one of the ahas, pickups from my research is that student success is not just a consequence or not, it doesn't just depend on students' academic abilities. That student success is not just a function of finances, but student success is a function of lots of variables, many of them social and environmental, over which we have control. So one is I, I left that, I got that sort of aha, that insight from my research. And then I got really excited because those are things we can do. Listen, there's only but so much money in the world. And there's only but so much money that an institution has that it can provide through scholarships, fellowships, and the like. Okay, that's, we know. The second is, uh, by the time you come to my college or your college or anybody's college, you've already had some preparation for college that we can't change overnight. Some students come to the college door. They graduate from high school. We know it's strong foundation in math, strong foundation in science, strong foundation in writing. I tell people all the time, I'm going back to where I began in our um, conversation, Baz. So people say to me, wow, you write so much. I love writing. It is something I write for, for, for my living. I write personally. I'm a person who keeps a journal. I love words, right? Um, I have students who don't like writing. And I have students who don't begin their graduate studies as strong writers. Mm -hmm. And they're often um, impressed by the fact that I like writing. I, I am not intimidated by writing and that I the way in which I write. And they'll say to me like, how did you learn to write so well? Well, a lot of it I learned through my career, through, you know, practice makes perfect, through all these things. But I will tell them, I am a good writer in part because I grew up in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And I went to Kempsville High School, shout out to Kempsville High School, go Chiefs. Um, and because of every single English and teacher I've had along the way. I remember having an English instructor in high school, Miss Pleasance, and she was pleasant. Um, but Miss Pleasance, she did not play when it came to writing. Mm -hmm. She would mark you low for poor grammar, for poor word choice. She was a teacher who would tell us when you write papers, even in high school, she would encourage us to keep the dictionary and the thesaurus open on our screen or beside us so that when we're writing and we're thinking about a word, don't just put a word there because it comes to mind. Make sure it's the right word. So like I think a lot about words and word choice in part because I was socialized to it in 12th grade or 11th grade with Miss Pleasance. And that has set me up for being an effective writer today. So as I think about, um, you know, the journey and the kind of work I do, I realize that I am who I am today mm. because of that sort of early training um, that I had. And, you know, part of it is I'm motivated to help other people um, do the same. And so as I you know, learn to write and write and write for a living, um, I realize that writing becomes my vehicle mm. for, you know, fighting for social justice. I mean, I see my research as an attempt at um, calling out injustice, mm -hmm. um, at, at writing wrongs and hopefully galvanizing support from other people in the fight toward justice. And some people speak it. I do speak it. I do that in keynotes. Mm -hmm. um, but I also do it through my scholarship and my research. And so this idea that came out of my research that student success is not the student's it's not based on just students, right? Students can work hard, they can study hard and still not succeed if we don't improve the social and environmental climate in which they study. That is a major pickup from our research. 
It is what motivated and inspired my work on belonging. And I think it is also the area over which we have the greatest control. Therefore, principals, superintendents, college presidents, provosts, parents, mentors, policymakers can all do something about that. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, so what I think. Um, uh, when did you realize that you wanted to dedicate your career to improving conditions for marginalized students in higher education? Um, I mean, I think the actual decision mm. to, I don't know if I would have thought about it as committing my career. That sounds, that sounds like me today, right? Um, the mature, experienced professional, but early on, I would have been too, you know, professionally immature, too young, um, too inexperienced to know what I was about to do was make a career choice. When I went to get my doctorate, I did not go to as a career choice. I went because I was in a job working at the Council of Graduate Schools as a research associate. There were all these cool projects happening in the agency that I could not be a part of because I only had a master's and I was not included at the table. I asked a black woman who was a scholar in residence there, Dr. Ann Pruitt Logan. It's very important to know that name for me because at the time, Ann Pruitt Logan was the scholar in residence, but she had been the dean at The Ohio State University the currents of life would move such that I would go on to be a professor at Ohio State University, I think in part because of my relationship with um, Anne, I knew something about the place. Anyway, I turned to Anne, I said to her, look, there are all these meetings happening and I'm not included. How do I get included? And she's like, oh, baby, you can't get included until you have a doctorate. And so I thought, you know what, then I need to go get a doctorate. I thought the only people who had doctorates, uh, Baz, were medical doctors. And so I told her, I was like, but I don't want to be a medical doctor. And she was like, no, get a PhD. I didn't know what a PhD was. No one in my family had a PhD, but Anne and people like her introduced me to it and talked to me about what a scholarly research career would look like. So at that point, I knew I wanted a doctorate. I knew that I wanted a doctorate so I could have an academic or scholarly research-based kind of career, but I didn't know enough to know enough. And so when I... Um, I was at the Council of Graduate Schools. They downsized, which meant they got rid of a lot of the research team people, and I needed a job. And someone told me to go work for the public school system, and I did. So I was working in a Title I, low income, predominantly, if not exclusively, minority school in Prince George's County, Maryland. And the school doesn't exist anymore, but um, I will never forget going into the school. Remember how I talked about my school growing up, right? All of my schools, like when I was in high school, I remember in 12th grade, I taught, I took AP history with Dr. Mitchell. I took AP chemistry with Dr. Tricano. I took AP physics with Dr. Shan. My point is this, my high school had a lot of AP courses and every teacher, for the most part, in the 12th grade had a doctorate. I thought that was true for all students. It wasn't until I became a scholar, a researcher of you know, educational equity that I realized that's not true for most students. And so I went to this award-winning, high-resource, affluent high school where every single teacher was teaching in their field of expertise. And they were paid well. So that meant they had the resources and the time and the energy to give um, over to our success. And as a result of that um, experience, I was set up for success. Now, fast forward. I'm teaching in a low income, predominantly minority elementary school in urban Maryland. Mm. Um, I was a music teacher. When I first got into my classroom, there were no instruments. How do you teach music with no instruments? And when I asked about them, they said, oh, a lot of the instruments are broken and the district hasn't given us this and that and the other. Um, you know, I don't have to go into too much detail, but I mean, there were lots of disciplinary problems in that school. Lots of students were from single parent backgrounds or broken uh, relationships. And, um, you know, just a lot of challenges teaching there. And, but listen to this, every single student I met, mm -hmm had a distinct 
flavor of genius. Every single one of them were resilient. Many of them had overcome unimaginable kinds of barriers and challenges, yet they showed up to class. Maybe they weren't on time, but they showed up. Maybe their uniform, we were a uniform school. Maybe their uniform wasn't pressed and clean, but they showed up. And so I remember every single day as a public school teacher realizing how unequal education is, how inequitable education is, how unfair um, public education is. And I left with a commitment. I mean, that was your question is, um, when did I know that I wanted to commit myself to a career of this kind of work? I'm not sure that I ever consciously knew that, but I did know that I wanted to commit to addressing the kinds of problems I observed in my classroom. Why was it that my students who were um, just as capable, just as promising, just as deserving, didn't have instruments in the music classroom? Why is it that my, my students who were from this urban neighborhood um, not because they were bad kids, but because that's where they live. That's where their parents plopped down. And as a result, they were in this school where there was high truancy, lots of um, absenteeism, lots of turnover among the teachers, and that impacted their teaching and learning. I knew that I wanted to commit to creating change equity, justice, that all kids deserve good teachers, all kids deserve resources, all kids deserve feeling like they matter and they belong in school. And that's what I did. And so before I knew that I could commit to a career of it, I committed to the cause. And it was through my commitment to the cause that I discovered my career. I think uh, that's, that's amazing how, uh, how you kind of build your career around you know, I don't know whether I could name all my teachers, <laughs> Teresa, <laughs> how you can name them by subject, by grades. It's, it's so amazing how uh, you see them as mentors. And I'm sure all your students see you as mentors, not just your students. And they're going forward, every, all the listeners will also be looking into this. But being this prominent diversity scholar and bridge builder, what are some of the biggest obstacles you have faced and conquered along the way? Oh, I mean, we don't have enough time to probably cover all of those, but um, I can say this, um, you know, to anyone in your listening audience and who will listen or watch the video, who is like me, that is, you are committed to a cause and a cause for justice, a cause for freedom, a cause for democracy, a cause for humanity, mm. have to appreciate the fact that um, not everyone shares our commitment to that cause. Right. You know, we, there, there will by definition be opponents mm. to that cause. And sometimes when you're committed to these, this work and this cause, it sets you up for mm. um, opposition and for people to treat you oppositionally and for, um, you know, attack. And so you just have to, prepare yourself for that. And my grandmother, when she was alive, would say things like, um, that's why you got to put on your armor when you go out in the day, because, you know, if you're going to put on armor, whatever that is, you know, protect yourself from um, sexism, protect yourself from racism, protect yourself from homophobia, to protect your mind and your peace, to protect your joy, whatever you're trying to protect, you're, if you're going to put on something, armor to protect for it, um, why put it on if you don't expect to be hit and to be attacked? And so um, in my own journey, absolutely. I've had moments of opposition mm. and difficulty, some mm. more public and open than others. Um, you know, there have been times where my motivations have been mischaracterized. I mean, I am going to write and for social justice and equity until, you know, I can't anymore. And so, um, and when I do that, right, I'm gonna write. I don't wanna write and then just put it on a shelf. That's not um, satisfying to me. It's why it's, it, it, it is actually the motivation and mm -hmm. what moved me into writing more public access pieces I started my career writing a lot in highly 
rated, high ranking academic journals that the average citizen can't get access to. My grandmother could never read unless I sent it to her. She couldn't get access to it as a grandma living in North Carolina. My mom and dad can't get access to these things. I um, started my career speaking at a lot of um, high priced professional conferences that my mom and dad don't attend, um, that your mom and dad don't attend. And but but parents, pastors, grandparents, social workers, um, policymakers, politicians, they are my audience. Because I think if we're going to change the world in the ways that my research suggests it needs to be changed, it's going to take all of us, a whole village of people pulling together to do that. Um, so because I realized that was my audience and I was not reaching them through these privileged, exclusive um, academic channels, I then opened up to more public channels like social media, blogs, magazines, podcasts, shout out to your podcast, Equity Matters, um, to webcasts, to all sorts of things. I mean, I will do, I will consider a lot of different communication channels now because it provides a way of getting my message to and connecting with my audience, right? Um, well, I say all that to say, when I started doing that, doing more public speeches, keynotes, podcasts, TV spots. There were people fundamentally committed to misunderstanding me who said things like, oh, he's trying to be rich and famous. Oh, he's just trying to be a rock star. Oh, he thinks himself to be all of that and more. Um, and some of them, you know, would just say these things in private. But mm -hmm. every, some of them, no doubt some who will likely listen to your podcast, said these damaging, hurtful um, things, you know, around tables when I was up for an award or I was being considered for an elected position in a professional association or, you know, dare I say, when I'm up for tenure and promotion. Now, for tenure and promotion, for... Yeah, the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and at The Ohio State University, ultimately it all works out. But people still planted those seeds that were intended to mischaracterize my mm -hmm. motivation, that I'm not committed to a cause, that I'm really committed to myself, and I'm not committed to creating change, I'm committed to creating and making money, that I'm not trying to um, leave, improve the academy for other people. It's not altruistic in that way, it's very selfish. And it's about amassing um, monuments to myself. And so what I would say to anyone listening to your podcast who's committed to the cause is please understand that those minority, I don't mean um, racial minority, I just mean number, there will be a small few people who will be against you and they will oppose you and they will say all sorts of things against you. But uh, I found the most success when... I realize that they're always in the numerical minority, that there are always more people for you and supporting you than who will ever be against you. Even if the people who are against you are doing it in loud ways and they're making a lot of noise and they're making a lot of motion, sometimes you just got to silence that noise in your head, stop paying attention to um, what's distracting you, and then really turn your attention to those who love you, those who support you, those who encourage you and use that as fuel in your tank to continue fighting toward the cause. I'll close with this. I, I didn't just realize this through my own professional um, attacks and so forth. I, I remember this in the classroom. When I remember, I'm not a, I was not a licensed teacher who went through a teacher prep program when I started teaching in that school in Maryland. And so I would have like 30 kids in my class and three of them would start cutting up, Baz. And they, you know, they're talking out of turn and they're pushing each other and they're shoving. 30 students, 27 of them are behaving and they're orderly and they're ready to learn music. But three misbehaving students would always throw me off. And I'm trying to teach and I'm like, sit down, stop, put the stapler down. I'm going to send you to the office. I'm going to make it. And I gave so much attention to these three students who were not ready to learn that I missed the 27 who were ready to learn. 
And the 27 who were ready to learn, their experience was always interrupted because I gave so much attention to the three. I'm going to use that to say to your listening audience that when you're doing this work and you're committed to the cause of justice and social um, um, equality, there will be distractors. And there are days where you'll be frustrated and angry. Like, listen, right now, I'd be, it's not lost on me that we are having this conversation about a week after the Supreme Court made a pretty significant decision in the U.S. Um, affecting affirmative action, distraction. Listen, the court has decided that race is no longer a compelling interest to justify the use of affirmative action or intentional strategies to remedy present day effects of past discrimination. I don't agree with that perspective, but that's the Supreme Court's decision. They did not ask for my opinion. I mean, if they did ask for my opinion, the weight of that opinion went toward a perspective that I don't support. Okay, now we need to talk about it. We need to interrogate it. We need to discuss it. But here's the thing to everybody who's a social justice warrior and fighting for equity, we cannot lose ground and lose focus on the goal. That is a distraction. So we can't stop here and rest on our laurels. We have to talk about it and interrogate it, analyze it, derive from it what we need, but then use that as fuel to keep fighting. And I don't mean fight with our fists, I mean fight with our scholarship, fight with our research, fight with our voice, fight with our vote, fight with um, the kind of change that we will create in our communities, our schools, our courts, our systems, okay? So um, I say to people um, quite often now, you know, I, and this is um, something that I am, um, I think I take very seriously, you know, I, some of the attacks that you will experience when you're committed to this cause can be relatively minor. And then some of them are larger in their impact. And so I realize that I have survived a, an attempt um, at what I call professional assassination, an individual who tried their best to, um, launch such a significant attack on the work I do and how I do my work and why I do my work and where I do my work, that it would um, it would cost me my career. It would take me out of the field. Um, and I know many people who have experienced those things and they were not able to recover. I'm blessed. I count myself blessed and fortunate that I recovered. And recovery doesn't mean that I still have a job and I'm still speaking and I'm still writing, although that is very true. Recovery also for me is um, the fact that I'm able to have this conversation with you. I'm able to talk about it without falling to pieces. I'm able to um, hold the past in its proper place and realize it's not my present, it has no bearing on my future. I'm able to do it in a way that I'm not bitter towards the individual who manufactured that storm against me. Um, and I'm able to forgive and embrace not just the individual, but all the institutions who were complicit and individuals who were complicit. And sometimes complicity is silence. People who sat back silently and watched this happen. Um, so I'm able to talk about it in a way that's productive. I'm going to talk about it in a way that's healthy because I've healed since that time. But most importantly, I'm able to help other people because I've met a lot of people who have faced similar kinds of workplace trauma, and I'm able to give them advice about how to move through it. And so to those who will listen to this episode, who will wonder, you know, why your boss is picking on you or why your colleagues don't invite you to the happy hour or why your evaluation is never fair and just or why you got overlooked in that promotion. I just want you to know, I see you, I hear you, you, you matter, you're enough and never too much and you belong right where you are. And that each and every day, though I probably never meet you and I may never meet you, I send good vibes your way. I send, send love and light your way. Just know that even in this moment, you are not alone. And that on your darkest day, believe it or not, you are someone's brightest light. When I was going through that storm myself and I felt like the days were dark and long and I didn't know what tomorrow would hold, I would get on the stage, give a talk. And at the end, someone would come up and say, oh my, with tears in their eyes, oh my gosh, that's exactly what I needed to hear today. Man, you motivated me, you inspired me, you educated me. And what it taught me is sometimes your impact will um, outsize and outpace um, your 
um, situation. That just because you're in a storm doesn't mean that you're always stormy. That just because you're going through a problem doesn't mean that you can't be someone's solution. That just because you're going through a fight doesn't mean that you can't help someone else. And so um, to everyone who is that light for other people, just keep on shining. Mm, wow, I think you... This, I was able to really relate to this. The whole reason why I have to launch this podcast is exactly what you just mentioned of a professional character assassination where uh, people made some comments and they never had any evidence against it, but I need to end up going through the battle of proving innocence. And, and it all happened because of a handful of people. And what I realized was there are so many people who have been going through this. And because of the journey, Tarel, I'm able to meet you now and thank you. I think these words mean a lot to me and every every single listener and everybody who's going through this on a day-to-day basis. Thank you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. So, uh, I mean, like, you know, let's talk about, uh, you know, you, even though you, you, you kind of went through, like, you know, there are a lot of positive moments that you had, which could have been the most rewarding or memorable in your journey. Someone, that one person or this one group of children or one student's, or anything, anything comes to your comes to your mind where among all your accomplishments, what are some of the key moments that you cherish um, personally as most rewarding and memorable? Yeah, that's a great one. Um, you know, there there are so many moments. I think to anyone who's an educator or a mentor um, in the social service or helping professions. My mom's a nurse, and so I count them as a helping profession, too. Um, Anyone who's in that line of work knows that one of the beauties of these jobs, I mean, you're not going to be, your salary may not always be the highest, right? Um, Although sometimes it can, but it's not always going to be the highest because we didn't get into it for the salary. We didn't get into it for the money. But um, what makes these these professions so rewarding is you have so many days where you realize you're making a difference and these sort of transformative moments that you're asking about where you know um, you help someone. And so uh, in my journey, yeah, I've had many. I mean, one time I met a woman on a plane who um, quite honestly, I just thought she was a beautiful woman. She sat beside me and I thought, I don't know who this beautiful woman is, but she's very, very attractive. Um, And she started talking to me and I learned that she was a single mom. um, And quite honestly, she was a single mom with two kids and, um, you know, took care of her appearance because it was her way of making money, said even more directly. She spent time in the um, entertainment industry. She stripped at nightclubs. She um, would be an escort to people for money. Um, And I remember growing up, remember, I grew up in the church, I grew up in a very conservative family. So as she's telling me all this stuff, I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, this is all bad, bad, bad. And what I realized through that conversation with her is that people have to appreciate the fact that there is, there are multiple industries in the world, education, business, law, logistics, and entertainment. And some people in the entertainment industry, um, you know, use their gifts and their talents and their assets to make a living so they can pay their bills and take care of their kids. That conversation with that stripper on the plane helped Mm. humanize that line of work for me in a way that I just could not have imagined prior to that. Well, what I also learned is as she's asking, she's telling about what she does. She says, what do you do for a living? I said, oh, I'm a college professor. And she's like, oh, really? Because I've always wanted to go back to school, but I'm probably too old now and all of these kinds of things. And so I was able to tell the stripper on the plane, listen, mom, you are not too old to go back to school. You absolutely can. You absolutely should. She said, oh my gosh, I wouldn't even know where to get started. She lives in Atlanta. I said, well, let's swap information. I bet you I could help in some way. And by the time I made it back to Ohio, which is where I was living at the time, uh, we swapped phone number, Instagram, email, all that stuff. I started Googling community colleges, four-year schools in Atlanta. And then I hit up mom and said, hey, look, here are some schools that you want to get started with. If you want to get started slowly, you can start at a community college that is going to be highly affordable. Look, I got to cut across the field on the story. Long story short is I helped mom apply 
to the community college. She goes to the community college in Piedmont or Piermont, whatever it is in Atlanta. Um, Baz, she graduates. And because we stayed in touch, and I'm getting emotional just thinking about it, she writes me and sends me her graduation announcement. And she invites me to her graduation. And in the middle of writing books and grading papers and giving talks, I went to Atlanta uh-huh. to watch stripper mom, <laughs> who no longer was a stripper by the time she graduates because she realizes she can make a living for herself and her kids with her new associate's degree. And she doesn't have to do that anymore. And I'm not saying that you have to leave the entertainment industry. I'm simply saying for me, going to that graduation and watch, and I got to meet her kids and just knowing that, listen, as I fight back tears, all moms and dads love their kids. Mm. All grandmas and aunties and uncles love their students. And people are trying to do the best they can with what they've got. And sometimes we need to get over ourselves and our prejudgments and our preconceptions of each other and see the humanity in one another and help more than hurt. And before you know it, you know, the currents of life move to where I could go. By the way, she finishes with so much gas in her tank and so excited about education. She ends up pursuing a bachelor's degree and she enrolls at Georgia Perimeter College. So she's probably, I don't know, she could have a master's degree. She could have a doctorate by now for all I know. But um, that is one of those moments where I realize, wow, you can really make a difference in someone's life sometimes just by getting over your implicit bias and your prejudgments and listening to people's story and seeing their heart and their humanity and finding ways that you can help. And it wasn't dramatic. I didn't have to do a whole lot. I just had to do some Google research, dispel some myths, help her, you know, think through the application. So for instance, and I'll stop here, you know, there's a part of the application that was asking about like some financial situations. And so, um, you know, mom is divorced. And she was like, well, I don't want to put too much information here because will it mess up her financial situation? Will it disclose some information that will cut off social services or supports that her and her kids depended on? And I was able to help her understand, no, 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 these systems are not connected in that way. But if you've never been to college, how would you know, right? So that was one of those moments where I was able to make a difference with some really simple kind of support. And that made me feel very good and proud. Oh, wow. I think this is, is amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Chari. And I think, you know, and this is what, you know, the story is all about. But thank you for sharing. I mean, like, uh, so uh, uh, let's now talk more about Terrell. I mean, like, what does Terrell do when he has some free time? What are your hobbies and interests? Well, you know, I'm glad you're asking me this question now. I have answers. Um, a few years ago, I would have been struggling on this question because, as I've said to folks um, early in my career, I think, you know, if I could go back and do things over, would I do a lot of things differently? Um, I'm not sure if, I, if a lot of things, but I mean, one thing that I was very, I'm very conscious of now is that, you know, people say 13 books, 200 publications, you know, hundreds of graduate students. How did you do it? Well, you can't do that without making some sacrifices. And, um, you know, I upgraded my work life and mm-hmm. I downplayed my social life. So, you know, I didn't hang out much when I was a professor at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. I didn't party when I was a professor at The Ohio State University. Um, I didn't go on vacations when I was vice president for academic and student affairs at Lemoyne Owen College. And I didn't um, take exotic um, trips abroad when I was provost at Virginia Union University that I spent most of my time at work as provost. I spent most of my time on campus as a vice president. I spent most of my time with my graduate students doing keynotes and research and running my center at Ohio State. I did spent most of my time writing at the University of Tennessee Knoxville. So consequently, um, I think I have a lot to show for professional accomplishments, but I have less to show in terms of Um, new friendships, relationships, hobbies, and interests at that time. Mm -hmm. 
So to anyone of your listening audience who's sorting through these things, I would advise you, I think work-life balance is important. Work-life balance for me is not a 50-50 kind of thing. It's not like I put three hours on my work and three hours on play. It just simply means that I allow myself time to recharge, to have fun, to do things that are not work-related. And the same way that I schedule, because I am, I mean, most of my team knows I am by my schedule. So I knew I was supposed to hop into this Zoom with you because it was on my schedule. If it's not on my schedule, it may as well not exist, but I put everything on my schedule. If I have to go, <clears throat> excuse me, run an errand, I put it on my schedule. If I got to go to the bank, I put it on the schedule. If I need to um, grade papers, I put it on my schedule, whatever it is. So because that is how I do my professional life, for me, it has become important that I also put my personal stuff on my schedule. So yesterday I went to Zumba class oh, and nice. I went for a solid hour and it's on my schedule and it will be there every week because I had so much fun, Baz. I was laughing and dancing and moving and it was a good workout. But the whole time I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm doing this for myself. I'm having fun. I'm not in front of a computer. I'm not writing a paper. I'm just dancing and working out. How cool is that? The day before that, I went to yoga in the park um, mm -hmm. where you go out, you have yoga mats, you sit in front of a yogi and you practice yoga. And the birds were chirping and the sun was shining. And again, I was smiling, mm -hmm. laughing. And I know people nearby had to be thinking, what is wrong with this guy? It's because I'm giving myself for the first time what I know Terrell, that's what you said. Let's talk about Terrell. I know Terrell needs this because Terrell's been um, managing a lot. You know, the um, professional trauma that I talked about, um, I'm still healing from, I'm I mean, I'm going to be healing from it for a long, long time. It's been years since it happened, um, but I'm still making sense of that. It's not just that. I mean, I'm coming back like all of us from the pandemic. <clears throat> the pandemic was hard because I was provost of a university during that time. And I watched faculty and staff <clears throat> who lost their life during that time. Um, I lost loved ones to COVID. So Terrell is still a work in progress. He's healing. He's making sense of it all. And he needs to unplug, unwind, let his hair down. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad that I'm at a point where I'm giving myself that. So in my free time now, I go to yoga, I do Zumba, I run. I've, I've been a runner for a long time. Um, I ride my bike. I am going to a concert tonight. Um, I am a musician, so I'm, I play the piano when I want to. Um, I have no intentions of ever being a bodybuilder, but I do have a little workout thing in my house where I can do some pull-ups and I'm really about fit and form, not so much muscle. And so I do take steps to um, keep my body in shape. And then lastly, I'm a vegan. So um, I watch what I eat and I enjoy thinking about um, vegan cuisine. Put all that together. That's my sort of outside of work curriculum. And um, like I said, I don't just leave it to chance. These days, I'm very intentional about putting it on my schedule so that each week I'm making time for these because they're just as important. What I've learned is um, some people say, oh my gosh, I can't believe you spent a whole hour doing yoga. That seems like a waste of time. No, no, no. Without that hour in yoga, I would not be able to put six hours on the book. Without that hour in Zumba, I probably would not be able to have this hour long conversation with you. Mm -hmm. These balance each other out. They are not at each other's expense. Together, they make sense. And so anyone who is still fighting that, listen, I fought it for a long time thinking, no, all of my waking time must go to work. First of all, that's unhealthy, it's unproductive and you won't be well. Make time for yourself, prioritize yourself, be unapologetic in giving time to yourself, and then set those boundaries and ensure that people and you respect them. Okay. Thank you, Terrell. So let's get into the nutters round the last 15 minutes. There is no right or wrong answer. Whatever comes in your mind is the answer. These are random, rapid questions. You ready, Terrell? Ready. <laughs> so... If you were to give a TED talk on a topic totally unrelated to your work, what would it be about? 
love and relationships. If you're curating a required reading list for life, not academics, what book tops your list and why? Um, a friend of mine is Tuesdays with Maury um, or The Hope in the Unseen by Ron Suskin, partly because they're just really wonderful stories about relationships and about people and how you can overcome setbacks and tragedy. And it reveals, I think, the power of the spirit and the soul. If you could go back in time and sit in any historic lecture or an academic event, which one would you choose to go? Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, I would like to go back and to hear a historic event. Um, well, I'm a, as a keynote speaker and an orator, mm -hmm. um, I'm really inspired by other speakers and one whose approach I find very um, instructive for myself is Martin Luther King. So mm -hmm. I would go back to any moment that he gave a talk, maybe like the I have a dream speech. Oh. So what's your go-to karaoke song? My go-to karaoke song? Uh -huh. Oh my gosh. Um, let me think. My go-to karaoke song. Okay, so one is Love by Music Soul Child. Only because I know the song. I know the lyrics. I could sing it, um, you know, without accompaniment. But probably, and I love karaoke, by the way. So I'm glad you're asking the question. So if I don't do Music Soul Child, where I have to perform it out loud with my real voice, but it's more like lip singing, I pick anything by John Legend. Shout out to John Legend. I absolutely hope that he listens to this podcast. Him and Pharrell, those are my idols. I love them both. I love you both. Hit me up on social media. Do something. Let's get connected. <laughs> <laughs> if you're given a one minute ad slot during Super Bowl that you couldn't sell, what would you fill it with? Um, what this is uh, during Super Bowl? Yeah, and it's uh like an ad. Yes. Um, I think I would fill it with. You know what I would fill it with? Probably mm -hmm. a quick story about my grandma and me singing this little light of mine. Oh, that's so beautiful. <laughs> Have you ever had a fanboy moment with anyone you have met in your line of work or in personal? Yes, I just told you. John Legend. I met him in person and I fanboyed, fan personed. I did. I just lost it. I mean, I, we took a picture together and I held it together. But um, and interestingly enough, I am from Virginia Beach, 757, where Pharrell is from, Pharrell Williams, who sings Happy. Um, but I've never met him in person. So if I ever do, though, I imagine myself fainting. So. Don't know. Time to tell. <laughs> That's good. Obviously, being an academic, that comes with a very interesting, uh, you know, day every day. What's the weirdest or a funniest question a student has ever asked you that you still remember? Am I an adult? <laughs> <laughs> Students used to ask me that. They still sort of do. They're like, are you an adult? Um, <laughs> essentially they're trying to get at how old am I? And they're usually surprised by um, my relative youth. And I think I am fortunate to pull off that maybe I'm looking younger than I actually am. So that, that was the funniest question. Literally a student was in my present and they were like, I have a question, are you an adult? And I was like, yes. <laughs> yeah. You are, you are. Definitely we need to put the video up so that uh, listeners who are listening, you can actually see who is, who is Terrell is. You'll be so yes. proud. The surprise. So, uh, so uh, what's one thing you are surprisingly bad at, Terrell? Surprisingly bad at? <laughs> yeah. I am surprised. Okay, so, I mean, I don't even know if it's surprisingly bad. I mean, I do not cook. I cannot cook. I know nothing about cooking. Anything I do, now baking, I can do a little bit of that. But I mean, cooking, like take a pot or a pan out and make food happen, not my lane. Um, and I am surprisingly bad at most sports. I mean, I'm not 
I don't know the laws or the rules, laws, the rules of basketball. I don't know the rules of football. I will watch them as a social event with friends, but like me on a court or a field playing them, I am remarkably, amazingly bad. <laughs> I think that's the, that's the thing, isn't it? Because of who you are, there is a perception or the expectations of maybe you could do that. Are you sure you can't play basketball? <laughs> Absolutely. Put me on a team and I will prove to you <laughs> without <laughs> that I'm not good at it. <laughs> That's good. If, if you could compare yourself to a fictional character, who would it be and why? A fictional character. Yes. Um, so I don't know if you know the movie Simon Birch, but if not, you those in your listening audience, you should watch it, Google it. But it's based on a book called A Prayer for Owen Meany. I read it in Miss Pleasant's class in 11th grade. Um, thick book, I think it's by John Updike, if I'm not mistaken. But um, anyway, it's a story about a little kid who actually is born with a disability, a deformity. And so he's very, very tiny. And um, but has a larger than life personality. And mm -hmm. though he is different looking and different from people, he wins them over very easily. And people often wonder like, how can you have such a positive outlook on life? You're this small, you know, deformed kid um, who medical doctors don't predict will live very long. And Simon Birch, or Owen Meany in the book says, it's because I'm here for a purpose. I have a purpose, my purpose, I have a big purpose to fill in the world. And that's what um, animates them through all of the, the world and all these, these scenarios you see. So if I had to compare myself to someone who's fictional, I think about Simon Birch, that story, I can never watch it without crying by the end, partly because it resonates on a personal level with me. I'm five, six, 125 pounds, I'm a small dude, um, but I do generally have a positive outlook on life. And I believe that we can make the world better than we found it. And I believe I can play a role in it. And though I'm not good at football and basketball, I do know that I have skills and talents and I am good at research. I am good at um, translation of research to practice. And I do feel like I have a bigger purpose in the world and that my purpose in the world is larger than my physical makeup and physique. And that's why that story and that character resonates with me. Ah, oh, that's a nice, that's a nice. So thank you, thank you for sharing. If you could have a dinner with three individuals, living or dead, who would you choose to and why? Living or dead? All right, so let's see. I mean, there are way more than three, but let's just pick three that I can explain. One, I mean, so I've mentioned Pharrell, I've mentioned John Legend. I would have one person at this dinner is um, President Barack Obama. Oh. And hopefully he'll bring Michelle and she just counts as a one plus um, <laughs> or a plus one. Because I just, I, I have enormous respect um, for him. I think he's smart, a good spirit and soul. This, I want him at the table. Um, secondly, I would want to invite, um, you know, I'm thinking a lot these days about my upbringing and my family. And I know my mom, my dad, I knew my grandparents, um, but I did not get to meet my great grandparents and spend much time with them because either they were dead before I was born or the deceased when I was a, they passed when I was a baby. So I would love to invite to the table my maternal great-grandmother, my mom's mom, Dolly Wilder, just because I love my grandmother. I love my mom. I know so much. I learned so much from these women, and I've learned a lot from Black women. So shout out to all the women of color, all the Black women in your listening audience who have you know, held it down for so many years, who have been there for their families, their communities, their students. Um, I know that I'm the beneficiary of strong women, especially strong Black women, who have um, paved the way for me. And so I would want one of those people to be my maternal great-grandmother. And I'll do a fun one for the third. The third would be, uh, you said living or, and I gave you someone who's not living. Um, I would love to have at the table, um, you know, 
actually, um, when I was in, what grade was it? Uh, high school. Uh, I mentioned my best friend, his name is Jason. Jason is living. Um, and then we sort of got away from each other through college. And I now learned that he is um, a producer in LA and he makes a lot of money. He does. I haven't talked to him in years. I would, the third seat to my, you know, high school best friend, Jason, so we could reconnect. I could catch up on life and what he's been able to do. That's that would be nice. And Jason, if you do listen, please do get in touch with Terrell. I'm sure Terrell, you'll be in touch with him immediately. I'll go. Thank you. So what's the most interesting or a bizarre fact you have heard about your chosen field that you actually want to debunk? Um, so I have heard that education is um, sort of like a dead in uh street it is um you know a lot of work and no money mm. a lot of stress mm. and no reward mm. um that the payoff is not worth it mm. and so i would like to debunk that by saying that you know my grandmother who was a teacher for 50 some years before she retired um, you can't go to where she lived. She lived in Trenton, North Carolina. If you go to Trenton, North Carolina and go anywhere, you can go to Hardee's, you can go to the bank, you can go to Piggly Wiggly, which is a grocery store. Say my grandmother's name out loud and someone in that store is going to know her. They're going to remember her. And if you and if you ask them, how did you know her? They're probably going to say something like she was my third grade teacher. She was my fourth grade teacher. She was my fifth grade teacher. That my grandmother has been deceased now for almost a decade and I'm still meeting people mm. who she taught who she influenced and she impacted so if you're looking for a profession where you can have lifelong impact and make a difference teaching and education is absolutely that field secondly I'm a musician um I play the piano my first piano I remember my mom saying I don't know it's very expensive we can't afford it we had to save for it and my grandmother who was a teacher at the time said, if my grandbaby wants to learn the piano, I'm going to pay for it. And my mom said, well, we don't have the money for it. And my grandmother said, well, then I'll have to get it. And she reached into her bank. And hopefully when you put the video up, people will see what I'm doing. My grandmother banked at a physical bank, but she kept a lot of money in her person. And so deep down in her, um, her personal gear, my grandmother would wad up money and tuck it on her body because that's what they did back then. They just believe that you don't put all your money in a bank, you put keep some of your money with you. And I remember my grandmother paying cash for my first piano. Um, so I remember watching that as a kid and realizing when the nurse and the car salesman didn't have enough money, mm. the teacher did. And my grandmother taught me how to save because she saved a lot. So if you're looking for a career where you can make a difference, where you don't have to be rolling in the dough, but you will get money, you can get a respectable um, salary, although we still need to deal with teacher pay equity inequities. We got to increase teacher salaries across the board, across states, um, and that work is important. But you can pay your bills, keep food on the table, and help those that you love. And then third and finally is, um, you know, I now have trained students who have become professors, who are training students, who have become professors, who are training students. And so I'll go to conferences now, Baz, and some of my students will say, oh my goodness, I want you to meet your academic grandchild. And I'm like, my academic grandchild? What are you talking about? And it's one of their students. They see me as the father in the academic tree, and they are the descendant, academic descendant of me. And now they have academic descendants. And so if you want to get into a career, you can make impact. You can, you know, earn a respectable living and pay your bills and take care of those who you love, but also where you can continue to um, live, your work continues to live on through others and that you expand the village that's working in your space, education is the best way to do it. And that's something I wanna push back again. It's absolutely a reward, life 
long, rewarding kind of career. Mm, very, very, very well said. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So if your life was made into a movie, Terrell, who would you want to play you? Mm. Play me. Uh -huh. Let's see. I'm thinking in terms of casting me. So people always say I look like one of the members of New Edition. Um, uh -huh. And I've seen the guy, and so they're right. You do have some similar traits. So it might be good to cast that person because people who know me would be like, oh, he looks like him. But I think in terms of physique and build and size and acting and personality, it would probably be Little Bow Wow. <laughs> okay, that's it. <laughs> and what could be the title of the movie? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Um, maybe so my president um, of Virginia Union University Dr. Hakeem J. Lucas shout out to him who I know may very well listen to this recording or more than likely someone's going to listen to the recording realize I said his name and then tell him about it then he's going to go watch it so hello Dr. Lucas but he always says to me um, Strayhorn your work on belonging has another chapter to it and you got to get ready for the next book. And the next book is not about belonging. It's about becoming. Oh. And um, he helps me understand that after you journey to finding a sense of belonging, it doesn't stop there. That by the time you get to that destination, it's really not a destination. It's like a place, a stop. You have changed. You've grown. You've learned more about yourself. You've given up some things. You've acquired new things. And so you're yet, though you have found a sense of belonging, you are still in this process of becoming something else. And that's the beauty of it. And so I think the title of the movie is something like From Belonging to Becoming or Quest to Belonging and Becoming. Uh, that's beautiful. So if you are to explain the spirit of belonging to a child, how will you break it down, Tara? To a child, um, I would say that the spirit of belonging is about feeling safe, oh. feeling secure, feeling the warmth of love from those around you, mm, mm, mm. feeling the um, happiness of being seen and heard and included, not feeling overlooked or and ignored, just as you are, that you don't have to change your style of dress, you don't have to change your name or even your accent in order to enjoy those very positive sensations, feelings, vibrations. That's what I would say to a little kid. So finally, before we close this episode, uh, or this round actually, if you could solve one educational related issue overnight, what would it be and why? Hmm. I mean, I think one of the problems that we are facing in education today that deserves some solution is the fact that um, so many issues that we confront, um, how do you say this, um, you know, the problem with education is this, it is often talked about, but frequently misunderstood. It is discussed and presumed to be this industry or enterprise where all fields are level, um, that's based on meritocracy, you get what you deserve, everybody's got the same resources. And so one of the problems I would address if I could address it overnight is changing that perspective, changing that paradigm and helping people realize that 
education is a promising enterprise, but it is filled, it is riddled with inequities, injustices. Some people are set up to succeed while other people are held back and denied access to opportunity. That equal opportunity is nothing more than an illusion. It's an aspiration, but it is not the reality of how education happens in most schools, colleges in this country. So I think the first problem I would address so the first problem I would address is not so much a problem, but it's the framing of educational problems, that we stop seeing it as this equal sum game where if you get something, it's at my expense, that um, my success is dependent on just my effort, and I would work overnight to replace it with an equity-minded, social justice, race-conscious, or identity-conscious perspective that says, listen, we got to be honest about this. Where you live matters. Where you grow up matters. The kind of school you attend matters. It provides you access to either award-winning instructors who are teaching in their field, using high-quality resources, or it disadvantages you just by your positionality, your geography, to be zoned to a school much like the school where I taught as a public school teacher where you're in a music classroom with no instruments, teachers are teaching outside their field and many of them on provisional license. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Terrell, that was very profound. Terrell, you already mentioned so many uh, blessings you have in, in, in the minds of uh, individuals in your life. But let me ask you, who are the most influential people in your life and career? Most influential. I mean, as a Christian, I derive my meaning and purpose and providence in life from higher source that I identify as God. So certainly I think that my faith in God is very important to me and it is part of my formula for success. Uh, secondly, my mom and dad and my family broadly conceived, but my parents have been just in amazing um, resources and supports and vessels of love and um, unconditional acceptance. And so I'm grateful for that. I think that my parents are so great because they came from good stock. And so my grandparents, my maternal grandmother, um, I didn't know my maternal grandfather. He died before I was born, but uh, I did know my paternal grandmother and grandfather. And so my family, my aunties, uncles, cousins, all of them are major uh, inspirations and supports in my life. I think Third, all of my mentors and advisors. So I talked about my doctoral advisor, but I've also had um, my doctoral advisor is a uh, you know, white male Texan. So this is just to tell everybody in your listening audience that mentors don't have to look like their protégés. What makes a mentoring match work in my mind is that you have two people who are invested in one another, who can see promise and potential in learning in one another. And sometimes those are matched by race and gender and or other identities. Sometimes they're not. And so um, I, my doctoral advisor was wonderful, is wonderful for me. But I also have had Black and Black male and Black female um, mentors who have made a difference. And so I know that they have played an influential role in my life and my career. Um, my students, I say to people all the time, I mean, I love what I do. But if I were working with laboratory mice, I probably would not love it as much. Mm -hmm. um, what makes my work so exciting each and every day is that whether I'm working at a university um, in a classroom or I'm working in my center, the belonging lab, wherever, is I get to connect with students who have bright futures, good ideas, who believe in, who are committed to the same cause that I am and who believe in me and my work and want to be a part of it. And over the years, they have been wonderful um, students, advisees, collaborators, turned colleagues, and lifelong friends. And then lastly, um, you know, I'm at a point in my life where I really care deeply about relationships. And so my fraternity brothers have provided a level of stability and support for me and my partner. And together, these give purpose to life and um you know give me a sense of knowing what it's like to matter and to belong and to feel loved and so put all that together um those are the major uh influences and motivators that sustain me each day 
Brilliant. So much blessings in your life. And uh, we wish you the blessings continue more and more to your life um, to make you even more impactful within the community and uh, to everybody whom you touch, Jaraya. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, so as we close the episode, is there any part of your life or career or is there anything else you would like to share to the listeners? And also, what's next for Terrell? What's coming up? Yeah, no, I mean, we've covered a lot. Um, I hope that folks who listen to the episode get a lot out of it. Um, you know, I believe in education as um, my social justice, as Dr. Lucas would say. It is how I create change in the world. Um, and I've seen it do it. You know, I have seen, I say to people all the time, my mom and dad um, have never physically gone overseas or abroad. Mm -hmm. Mom and dad are now at an age where they don't travel across the country by plane, but they have been a lot of places through me because I tell them the stories. I FaceTime them and show them on my computer. Um, I remember when I stayed in this, it's early in my career, some association brought me as their keynote and they put me in this beautiful hotel. I mean, it was just this huge room and they had flowers and fruit and all this stuff in the room for me. And I was just, I had never experienced that before. I was so impressed and overwhelmed that the first person I called was my mom and dad. And I put them on the phone, I showed them the room and I showed them. So um, education opened up opportunities for me to experience that kind of life and lifestyle. Mm -hmm. and consequently, because they helped raise me and they play such a pivotal role in my life, my parents were able to see it too vicariously through me. Education did that. And so education is a tool for social justice, um, but it is ultimately about helping students be successful in education because it's because I graduated and I went on to complete the master's and complete a second master's and complete the doctorate that I'm able to talk about these things. Had I stopped, dropped out, or abandoned my plan somewhere along the way, I probably would not even be on this podcast with you today. So that's why I'm committed to understanding student success because the greatest benefits flow to those who finish the degree, not just start the degree. And so for me, um, you know, I always, always say access without success is useless. That what's the point of helping students get to school or get to college if we're not going to ensure that they're successful there, especially when we know that the greatest gains for them and their families and their communities and society are attributed and associated with those who finish the degree. So um, that's about all I can say about education. So for me next, I'm gonna keep doing what I'm doing. I'm gonna live in the sunlight as my grandma used to sing. I am going to keep going to yoga, keep going to Zumba, keep playing music, keep writing books. I just had a book that came out on historically black colleges and universities with my colleagues. They are both my former students, Dr. Michael Stephen Williams at the University of Missouri and Dr. Royale Johnson, shout out to both of them. He, uh, Royale Johnson's at the University of Southern California, but we serve as the co-editors on this book that looks at the future of historically black colleges and universities. Shortly, I will be announcing the release of a book on sense of belonging and campus involvement that's coming out. And I've got several other book projects that I will finish up this year, um, along with these journal articles and the courses that I'm teaching. I'll keep riding my bike, going for a run, loving my partner, um, and then tonight I'm going to a concert. So that's what's next for Terrell. Um, and then lastly, and finally, I'm so glad this came to my mind. This is um, really, really exciting for me is I've talked about my career. I've talked about my family, mm -hmm. talked about my kids. I've talked about my bike. But five years ago, almost, my daughter promoted me to be a papa because she had a, a daughter. And her name is Kinsley. And so what's next for me? There's a lot of time with Kinsley. Um, just enjoying her, watching her, celebrating her and loving her. And she will FaceTime and call me sometime and just be like, oh, Paul, Paul, I wish you could stay on the phone with me forever. And Kinsley, if you listen to this podcast, just know that Paul, Paul wishes he could stay on the phone with you forever too. Oh, that's so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Tourette. 
I can't express how much I've enjoyed and learned from this conversation, Cheryl. I think, you know, continue to be a big advocate for diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And the personal experiences have been incredibly enlightening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And just for our listeners who want to dwell deeper into these issues and follow your work, where they can find more information, Cheryl. Any, any point you would like to uh, share? Any links? Oh, absolutely. I mean, hopefully when we post the episode and we post the recording, please feel free to include all of my social media to those in the listening audience. I am T uh, uh, T L Strayhorn. That is T Terrell L for Lamont Strayhorn on all things social media. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me on Instagram. I go by my real government name, Terrell Strayhorn on Facebook, on LinkedIn. Um, and then if all of that fails you and you can't remember it, do not worry. Just go to www.terrellstrayhorn.com and all of my social media is linked there on my page. Special shout out to my team at Do Good Work Consulting. I couldn't do any of the work that I'm doing without an amazing team of people. So shout out to those on the administrative side. Shout out to the research team that operates in that space, as well as the research team at the Belonging Lab. You can find um, Do Good Work at www.dogoodwork.com llc.org and the belonging lab is hyperlinked right off of my own personal website brilliant thank you again so much Terrell. thank you thank you for joining us today wish you your family your loved ones your students everybody all the good health and happiness continue to inspire us continue to look after yourself continue to take time for yourself and do more and more thank you thank you so much Terrell. thank you so much my pleasure thank you to our listeners, thank you for tuning in. As we continue this conversation, let's all remember the importance of fostering a sense of belonging for everyone in our communities and working together towards creating a more inclusive and equitable society. Until then, I'll see you very soon. Take care.